Today I wanted to try to get out at about sunrise time again but I had some long exposure stuff in my brain and felt like I just need to go shoot some long exposure in the daytime with no filter so I'm going to set up go down and try to find a nice beautiful shot with the with some movement in the background so you can really set off the long exposure setting you know what I'm saying I'm gonna put your leash on There's two things that I get asked pretty often. One of them, why do I continue to go back to the same spots to do my photography work? And the answer to that is, you never know the difference that you'll see when you go out there. I mean, even though it's the same area, but the scene can change based on lighting, based on uh, whatever else is sitting out there in the environment. Heck, even the leaf colors, things like that. All of that makes a different scene and a whole different experience for me when I pull out my camera. I mean, if you look at this, this spot right here, I've taken this photograph, I don't know how many times. And every time that I've come out here, it looks totally different. And I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, I know this spot, but it never looks the same when I come out here, never. The other question I'm asked is, you know, Aunt, every time I see you, you got on some Clemson gear. Is that all you ever wear? Well, not always, but it's pretty close. There's a reason for that. Clemson Tiger's primary color is orange. And when I'm out here in the middle of the woods walking around, I think that it's in my best interest to wear something bright colored. So I tend to grab one of my beloved Clemson t-shirts. I don't want to be walking out here in the woods by myself as a black man and either get confused as somebody trying to do something wrong to somebody else because you have a bunch of females running around out here getting their morning cardio and if they see me off in the distance and know that I'm not doing anything stupid it's a little bit for their safety as well as keeping me from being accused of doing some crime that I know I didn't do, which I would probably lose in court or what have you, just because of the color of my skin. All right, so we made it out here, and this is a nice spot to show off long exposure because there's movement coming from the water, you know? That's the thing about long exposure. What happens is it allows you to catch motion blur with your camera instead of uh, trying to keep everything nice and crispy, you get a beautiful silky motion blur. I'm gonna show you how to do it. Okay, so first off, you need yourself a nice tripod. It ain't gotta be super expensive, just something that's, um, sturdy enough to hold your camera still for all of these shots that you're about to take typically with long exposure shots you have like a lens filter on there and that lens filter will allow you to shoot at a slower shutter speed and cut down the amount of light that's going to come inside of your camera because if you turn your shutter speed up in broad daylight like this you're going to get a really 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 bright shot that's, that's just how that goes because there's so much more light coming into your camera. You put a lens filter on it, uh, some type of neutral density filters, maybe like an ND8, ND16, something like that. But um, 
in my case, I'm not going to use a lens filter. I'm going to do a lot of photo stacking in post-processing. Another thing to consider having is some type of trigger system that allows you to set your shutter off without hitting the button on the camera. I have a Alpine Labs wireless trigger that actually works with my cell phone using Bluetooth. I also have a wired intervalometer that will allow me to do the exact same thing. You know, I just stand away from the camera, hit the button, and the camera will do the rest. So that's another thing that you, you should have. Can you do these types of long exposures without a tripod, without a wireless trigger or something like that? Yeah, you can. It's a little more difficult. You just have to be super, super steady. Be really consistent as far as where you're standing and just fire off as many shots as you can within the same spot, within the same range, and probably about every five seconds or so, and you'll get the same results. Just, it's a lot easier if you have these tools. It cuts down all of the extra variables and issues and whatnot. Okay, so we knocked that out. Um, I was able to get a few drone shots in too because the same principle applies to the drone. Drone has an altitude hold and it can hold steady. Line them up and shoot. So now we're gonna head back to the house and uh, get a little bit of work done and then we'll throw these into Photoshop and uh, show you how to do a long exposure. All right, so we are now back at my Nook slash studio slash office slash my spot. <laughs> We're gonna take a look at those shots that we grabbed out there and set up a fake long exposure. Um, we're gonna use Lightroom as well as using Photoshop. Most of the magic is done inside of Photoshop, but I like to incorporate Lightroom to start out because I do a little bit of my general editing to try to make things look somewhat neat before Photoshop has to do all of its crunching and whatnot to make it look the way we want it to look. So let's go ahead and fire up Lightroom and get these images pulled in. Ba -ba -ba -bum. And we'll start from this folder here. I'm gonna move that out of the way. All right. It's a good rule of thumb to try to snap about 10 photos. Uh, that's not too many and it's not too little, if you will, as far as the computer processing. And a lot of this is going to depend on how powerful your computer is because it's going to have to do a lot of math um, in the final production. So what I typically do first is look at my first image and do a batch edit because if everything is lined up properly, as far as the, the tripod and, and exposure and whatnot, it's, it's, the edit should be the same for each of the images. So I'm just gonna edit one and I'm gonna apply all of those edits to the remaining, to the remaining shots here. And let me do a few tweaks here. We'll speed through this stuff if we need to. All right, gotta move that out of the way. We'll move this over here, there. Okay, so we'll 
Do a little dehaze. Saturation, I don't really have to touch too often. Not sure about this white balance. That looks a little cool in temperature. I want to warm it up just a little bit. There we go. All right. So overall, that looks pretty good. My white levels are still a little bit off, but I'm not going to nitpick too much on this thing there. So that's a general edit, and this will do for now, just for the example's sake. So next, you go back to your library, and you want to select all of the images inside of your um, import here. And you can do a sync settings down here in the right, bottom right corner. And that's going to grab everything that you touch from an editing standpoint, and it's going to synchronize it across all of these images. There, that's done. So if I clicked on this one here, image number six, and took a look, image number six has the edit supplied to it. See? All right, so now we want to take these into Photoshop. And the beauty of Creative Cloud, which you can get for roughly $10 a month, which includes Photoshop and Lightroom, um, the beauty of Creative Cloud is the dynamic links in between them. So I'm going to right click all of these images to select them all. And let's do it this way. Then we'll say edit in. And then you go to open as layers in Photoshop. And what should happen is Photoshop is going to open up sometime today. Okay, so now it's pulling all the images in as a layer or as separate layers, not just one. Okay, slowly but surely. Okay, so now we have all of our images pulled into Photoshop as individual layers. And what I like to do is duplicate one of the layers, usually it's the bottom layer, and I'll just call it um, sharp layer or something like that. Okay. And then I'll make sure that I move it to the very bottom. And for now, I'm going to turn off the visibility of that layer. Okay. So now let's go ahead and highlight all of the layers. All right. So we want to make sure all of these layers are properly aligned. So we'll go to edit auto align layers. And I just selected first projection here as auto click OK and allow it to think and we're going to speed through this again okay once you see that it's gone through the alignment um, every now and then you'll see a few soft edges like right here on the bottom left uh, this tells me where the camera moved just so slightly so we can just fix that and crop it to where everything is is aligned together so I'm going to get rid of that little bit of missing information that I could pull this up to. At any rate, just crop it to how you see fit. Okay, so next you want to take all of these layers that you have and turn them into a smart object inside of Photoshop. So again, you do the whole select all of the layers, not your sharp layer. And then you right click on it and say convert to smart object. And it's going to take a second to do this too. So we're going to pause and let this thing do its thing. Did that sound right? Okay, so the smart object has been created. If you look over here at your layers, you notice all of those layers just got grouped into one smart object. And you can see it has a little funky icon on it. Next is where all of the calculations and magic happens inside of Photoshop. All right, so what you want to do is go to Layers, Smart Objects, and then you go to the Stack Mode. And this is going to take it a few minutes because it's just doing a lot of math. And you can select Mean or Median. I found that Mean gives me better results. Okay, doing this thing, doing this thing, and there you go. Now you see how it smoothed out all of that water, just like I was out there with the lens filter and shot it with the extra slow shutter. So this is what it looks like originally. 
And this is what it looks like with the long exposure hack, if you will. If you want, you can do more editing inside of this image here. Um, typically, I like to add a layer mask to my long exposure layer. And then I like to brush in the sharp layer to try to make sure everything looks nice and neat. So I'm going to hit B for my brush tool, hit X to make sure I got black revealed. And if I wanted to brush over the water just to show you the difference, I can do so like that. But I don't want that. So let me put that back. Okay. What I want to do is make sure all of the trees and things in the background are nice and sharp and full of detail. Even the back bit of the river sharpens up because it's not much movement showing there. So just make it nice and sharp. There we go. I think I'll even sharpen up the stones here. Like that. Okay, so there you have it. Um, if you want, you could do more touch up to this. I'm not going to do any more. I'm just going to stop right there for the sake of this video. All right, there you have it. That's how you create a fake long exposure without using an ND filter on your camera. Not that hard, right? Key to this thing is to make sure you have a steady foundation, locked in focus, a set white balance, and just let the camera snap the shots. After you got all your photographs, drop them into Photoshop, or in my case, Lightroom and Photoshop, and let those apps do all of the magic for you. It's not that hard, I promise. I appreciate you guys watching this video and all of the continued support of me and this channel. Be sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and pass this video along with that share button so other folks that are interested in photography can find this video as well. Thanks again for everything, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace out.